Welcome to another edition of Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Saturday, September 3rd, was the funeral of former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. Loved by many, blamed by some for the collapse of the Soviet Union. While many high-profile personalities came to say their final goodbyes, as his body lay in state in Moscow's Hall of Columns, one person was conspicuously absent. Russian President Vladimir Putin. And days before his office said the president would be busy on the day of the funeral. But it was there on Thursday to lay flowers at the open coffin. So, coming up on the program today is a world view of the man Gorbachev and the tributes. Later, I'll be talking to a former Nigerian minister, counselor, economic and trade desk at the Embassy of Nigeria in Moscow. Ambassador Chudio Kafo explains Nigeria's history with the Russian Federation during and post-Soviet era and his thoughts on Nigeria's invasion of Ukraine. But first, a quick check on other discussions in diplomatic circles. The Nigeria High Commission in Nairobi has rejected a parody news item released by an online platform on August the 31st, 2022, titled, Nigerians in Kenya have raised the alarm over targeted killings and forced disappearances by police accuse High Commission of complete neglect, describing it as a concoction replete with falsehood and unfounded allegations. A statement from the Nigeria High Commission in Kenya says it is not irked by such insinuations bandied about by persons bereft of the confidence to substitute their frivolous allegations and will continue to conduct its statutory obligations on behalf of Nigeria and Nigerians in Kenya. Meanwhile, the federal government has responded to a video on social media showing stranded Nigerians at the airport in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, on August the 29th, who were denied entry into the country despite having valid visas. A statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says the Nigeria mission in Dubai has clarified that most of the supposedly stranded Nigerians were issued family visas only to arrive in Dubai alone without any family member. They were consequently denied entry and advised to return to their country and apply for the appropriate visas. Those allowed into the country are those who have family members in the UAE. The statement reminds Nigerians about the new visa regime for the UAE. Former Morogue President Q Sampan, who was sentenced to life in prison, is due to receive a verdict from the Supreme Court Chamber of the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia for his appeal on Thursday, September the 22nd. Q Sampan, the former president of Cambodia's Ultramaoist Morogue regime, was found guilty of genocide against the Vietnamese people and crimes against humanity by a UN-backed court in 2018. Most of the estimated 1.7 million victims of the 1975-79 regime died of starvation, torture, exhaustion or disease in labor camps or were bludgeoned to death during mass executions. Russian President Vladimir Putin was not at the funeral on Saturday, but he did pay his last respects to Mr. Gorbachev, laying flowers at the open coffin of the last leader of the Soviet Union, who died last Tuesday at the age of 91. Government spokesperson Dmitry Peskyov told reporters on Thursday that President Putin will not attend the funeral ceremony for Gorbachev on Saturday due to the shadow constraint but the Gorbachev's funeral would have elements of a state funeral, including a guard of honor, and that the Russian state was helping with the organization of the event. Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has sent Nigeria's condolences to the family, government, and people of the Russian Federation over the death of the former Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. A statement from the ministry says the former president was one of the most influential leaders of the 20th century. 
and will be remembered mostly for his efforts at promoting global peace and security, which earned him the Nobel Peace Prize in 1990. An earlier message had come from Nigerian President Muhammad Buhari. When history is written, he will be, I think, one of the authors of a fantastic change for the better. Boris Johnson described the, the former leader and as one of those who changed the world, the unquestionably for the better. He said it was one of those who triggered a change, a series of changes that he perhaps didn't anticipate and that he may have paid the price for it. China expressed sorrow over the death of Gorbachev, saying he made positive contributions to the normalization of Chinese-Soviet relations. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz referred to him as a courageous reformer and a statesman who dared to do many things. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida offered his condolences and praised Gorbachev's legacy as a world leader who supported the abolishment of nuclear weapons. The last Soviet leader was buried on Saturday at Moscow's historic Novodovichy Cemetery, along with his wife, Rais, who died 23 years ago. Joining me now is Ambassador Chudi Okafo. Chukudi is a real name, but Chudi for short, Okafo. He was Chief of Staff to the Secretary to the Government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria before his appointment as uh, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary by the Fed President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria in November 2001. His last assignment was as Ambassador of Nigeria to the Kingdom of Thailand, Myanmar, from 2012 to 2015. He eventually retired from the Foreign Service in December 2015. But amongst his other appointments is his appointment to the Economic and Trade Desk at the Embassy of Nigeria in Moscow, the Russian Federation, from 1998 to 2003. Ambassador Kafo, thank you so much for joining me on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you, Amarachi. My pleasure. And I know that this is just a brief summary of the many years of work you have dedicated to your to service in the Nigerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I thank you, um, you know, for the time that you have served with the Minister and representing Nigeria outside of the country. Let's get into the discussion today, and that's you've talked to Russia uh, just a few years after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. As soon as your appointment was in 1998, those were the early days of post-Soviet Union with Boris Yeltsin as president. What were Nigeria's relations with Russia like back then? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, yes, you are right. You recall that, um, yes, I was there seven years after those um, challenging uh, period, and um, Boris Yeltsin was there also, at least for a year before he exited. And um, it's correct to say that um, his was actually a continuation of what uh, Gorbachev started. So um, our relationship, I, I, I said clearly, was uh, correct and cordial. Um, to the extent that we had no hiccups, we had no anything challenging, but in reality, there was no groundbreaking in that relationship because um, Russia then was preoccupied with um, a lot of transition, transformation, politically, economically, and then um, the focus was um, with the West, namely the United States, um, the European Union, principally UK, France, and so on. But then we continued our traditional diplomacy with uh, Yeltsin. We did all we could in respect of uh, political, you know, relationship, economic agreements we signed, and so on. We kept them. Now, it's very now important to say that, um, you see, those periods, because I mentioned, were really trying years. Nelson 
Yeltsin was um, very much occupied with uh, that particular perestroika, I mean restructuring and glasnost, openness, which um, his predecessor started. So in that period also, Russia had a lot of challenges domestically, like I stated, at the economic level. The economy was in the doldrums. Um, the Russian currency tumbled. Commodity prices, the same thing. And again, the main product they have, the oil and gas, at that period, even less than $10. So there were a lot of challenges. There was uh, corruption. So he was preoccupied with cleaning up. That was really the level of our relationship. Your own time was after Gorbachev had left, but even before then, did you have, mm -hmm. you also may have had an idea of what relations with Nigeria and the Soviet Union was like? Yes. The 60s and the 70s, really, um, beginning with Africa, you know, Soviet Union uh, prided itself, no colonial uh, state in Africa. Um, and they wanted to assist with Africa's uh, anti-colonial and anti-apartheid struggle, you know, at the period. And they asserted themselves uh, with the, especially the struggle in, uh, against anti-apartheid system and made all the good moves with some Southern African countries especially, but this included Algeria, of course. So in Southern Africa, you had uh, countries like Angola, you had Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, and of course the ANC in South Africa. They had a lot of relationship with these countries in terms of identifying with them, in terms of AIDS, in terms of even uh, military assistance, training for the ANC and others at that uh, period. So uh, Africa relationship with Soviet Union then loomed very large. Uh, but it was not until, um, I should say, the period of uh, during the Civil War on our own part that our relationship with uh, the Soviet Union, because uh, when we had the unfortunate uh, Civil War, our colonial master then, the Britain, uh, was reluctant to give arms and support to the Ni Niger Nigeria at that period, the federal side. Uh, so the Soviet Union came in, and uh, that changed the entire distance between us and uh, the Soviet Union. But remember, they had relationship in terms of diplomatic mission in Nigeria in 1961. And then we had in 1962 in Moscow, while theirs was in Lagos then. So because of the assistance they gave to us from 1967, 70s, mid-70s, and up to late 1970s, our relationship was, uh, I should say, very good. We had a lot of exchanges. You remember we had uh, something like the Ajokuta which they are still company, a metallurgical distance also. They helped us a lot in terms of the construction. We had the TH prom export from Russia that came here, although, of course, with the Ukraine personnel also. What they did was to help with the construction training capacity. At the level of uh, military cooperation also, a lot of things between us we had uh, cooperation and training of our people. You can also talk about education. A lot was going on. A lot of our people in terms of scholarship, capacity building, and so on, went to Russia and vice versa. We even had people-to-people -people relationship. Some Russians came here, including doctors, some teachers. The Russian Aeroflot, their airline also was I remember coming to Lagos. So we had a lot of uh, business to do in oil and gas, the same thing. The Russia's um, largest uh, gas company, yes, Gazprom, which is actually the world's largest, had relationship here with our own uh, people, NMPC. The same with the 
Russia's largest oil company, Luke Oil, they also uh, had some relationship here with us. So the relationship blossomed at that period. Uh, that's what that period signified in our relationship. A lot went on at the government level and at the other level too. That's the period of the Soviet era with us. My interview with Ambassador Kafa continues after the break. Stay with us. And now back to my interview with Ambassador Kafa on Gorbachev and how his actions may or may not have precipitated the invasion of Ukraine. And now uh, Gorbachev himself mm. died on Tuesday um, from, well, obviously illnesses uh, that we do not know of. And a lot of people came out on Saturday to pay their last tributes to him. You know, in Moscow, President Vladimir Putin was not there. Um, he, his office said he had uh, work to do on that day. But I also remember that people blame Gorbachev for the way things turned out. Uh, the fact that the Soviet mm. Union does not exist anymore, how powerful it could have been, you know, given the number of uh, years that have gone by and the current challenges that exist between Russia and its neighbors. What do you think about this? And, you know, is it fair to actually blame him for what happened? Or you feel that, you know, the Soviet Union was, it was inevitable that it was going to uh, separate into different territories and countries today? The demise, unfortunately, of the Russian um, icon, global icon, I should say. Um, it was good that um, both the government and people of Nigeria did the right thing by paying condolences. As for what he represented and uh, what he did, the funeral and what the Russians did, the truth is that, uh, first of all, it's a mixed bag, to put it this way, because um, he has, notwithstanding what he's done at the global level and the praises, you remember what he did by spearheading the reduction in the Cold War, talking of peace, the negotiations that were done. He went from uh, Washington to Iceland, to Geneva, to France, not just to meet uh, Reagan, he met Francois. Mitterrand of France, Margaret Thatcher, that was even before then, 1984, and so on, tried to build relations with China, relations with India. Now, his death, there is no secret that he's been an implacable, uh, I, I don't want to say opponent of uh, President Putin, because as far as President Putin is concerned, he helped to bring down the prestige and the capacity of the Soviet Union by helping to remove the Communist Party, by helping to remove the defense of uh, Russia, I mean, through Warsaw Pact, which was actually their counterpart to NATO, and also um, other things about the other republics, which were satellite states of uh, Russia, 15 republics, not to talk of Eastern Europe. Those are the allies of Russia. So the deaths will not come as a surprise that Putin did not make it a state barrier. He did not attend. I think it was only because of the sanctions now. An European leader from Hungary or so that attended the funeral. So that apart, for Russians, as I said, mixed feelings. Some truly believe that he did a lot at the expense of his life to bring democracy, to bring freedom, to bring other things for Russia, and including at the economic level. There was no way anyone, be it uh, the late uh, leader or any person, could stop the kind of changes or reform because it was glacial for anybody to control, see change at the level of the political testing, because these countries knew. They felt that something was holding them in terms of the regimentation, in terms of freedom, in terms of democracy. There was no way. So by the time the Georgia and the Baltic states 
of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania felt it was enough. There was no way you could control such a thing. You can imagine, say, East Germany, that 1989. By the time they crossed from the east to West Berlin in Germany and the Berlin Wall fell, there, there, there was no way anybody could control that. That's one thing with uh, leadership and something whose time actually came. So Gorbachev did what he tried, but uh, it will be expecting too much that anyone could actually stop that kind of change because he was not ready to call the Russian troops to go and uh, start uh, shooting people. The same 1989, like what happened in Tiananmen Square. No, that, that, that was not possible. And in any case, Gorbachev knew that Russia was not in any position to engage the US and allies on an arms race. That was very clear, and why he took the steps he did through the negotiations of nuclear stockpile, reduction of their conventional weapons, and other things he did quickly withdrawing their people from the bloody war in Afghanistan. So he knew that the time came. So it's not to say, well, somebody could have stopped it, retrospection and regret, which is normal in human affairs. But the reality is that uh, the thing was overwhelming. I don't think anyone could have stopped that. But Putin, President Putin has always been nostalgic about that as far as he's concerned. But to situate it, you need to understand, uh, we need to understand his background. I mean, he grew up through the KGB there for 15 years. He also worked in uh, East Germany. He was there in, in Dresden. He came back, and at the end of the day, he became the a director in the same KGB. So it was from there that um, another nationalist, uh, uh, Boris Yeltsin, President Boris Yeltsin then, called him to become an active president until he was now elected. So for him, <laughs> there is no way anybody can preach to him. He's been very distant about the status quo for Soviet Union. That's the kind of thing he actually wanted to be because he felt it was loss of prestige and respect and uh, protection militarily because for him, I mean, Russia still has the largest stockpile of uh, nuclear weapons. So why would they blink before the US and her allies? That's what he feels. So the other republics in Russia itself, uh, the way he governs the 89 regions of Russia, Talk less of these republics that are now free, will tell. So he is acting in character. Uh, no one will be surprised if you have followed the way so far to today. Yeah. In fact, he was also bewildered by the Ukraine conflict before he died. He was psychologically crushed in recent years by Moscow's worsening ties with Putin. What does that say about the man himself, uh, the kind of man that he was, and the lessons to learn from his life? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, again, what I would like to say here is that um, surely um, the late uh, Russian leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, was the, one of the greatest uh, leaders of the 20th century because of what he did to bring peace to not just Russia itself, Eastern Europe, and indeed, in many parts of the, of the world, he, the kind of man he, he was a man of peace. Otherwise, at the risk of his life, he wouldn't do what he did to engender freedom, to engender peace and uh, democracy in many parts of the world. So he has remained a reference point, irrespective of what some opponents may think about him. And the opposite of what he did, you can see, is what is going on in Ukraine and other, other parts of the, uh, in the Donbass and so on. People want freedom. People want independence. People want democracy. Finally, um, Ambassador Okafo, how do you think this war will end between Russia and Ukraine? I mean, you see the Ukrainian forces gaining up now against the Russian uh, forces, the, the ones who uh, invaded uh, Ukraine, how do you think the war will end? Um, many are saying they'll get back to the negotiating table, 
but how soon can that even happen? Yes, negotiating table will certainly be the way out. Um, I mean, you, you, you can't compare what Russia has militarily with Ukraine in any way, but you can see the determination of the people to defend their own land with their own blood and anything else. In any case, it has not been even with the overwhelming military superiority. You can see that it's not a walkover because they thought it was going to be a special military operation ending in weeks. But six months after, what have we seen? And I don't believe that the world, the UN and other organizations will allow unnecessary waste of life instead of uh, coming to a trust to establish peace and allow the two countries to pilot their own affairs. This is where we end the program today. Thank you for spending time with us. I'm Amarachi Ubani. See you next time. Thank you.